and if it's safe and effective, they approve it. After that, their job is to oversee, I mean, they have a number of jobs, one of which is to oversee the marketing of the drug. But it's not the job of the FDA to oversee what's published in the medical literature, and it's not the job of the FDA to monitor every grand round lecture or well, symposium. Well, wait a minute. But, uh, but some of these drugs aren't, are, the, the term effective is, uh, is deceiving because uh, some of these drugs are, are the, the data is showing that they're not as effective right. as, as the pharmaceutical companies are claiming. So the FDA's job right there is to throw up a red flag, is it not? You would think so. So they're failing there often. From what I read, often they're failing to, to uh, warn people that actually if you look at the stats here, it isn't quite as great a miracle drug as this company is saying. They're not doing that in, in many cases. That's right. I mean, th Why? Th they, they're, there's a lot of criticism that the FDA doesn't monitor um, drugs after they go onto the market. They're very rigorous about um, approving them. I mean, there's criticism uh, on both sides. Some, some people on the right think they don't approve them uh, fast enough. Some people on the left think they approve them uh, too fast. Um, but I think everybody agrees that once they're approved, there's not a whole lot of monitoring. Um, so you're saying that a lot marketed. of the problems that have happened with these drugs are after they're approved? Well, they're not. These things aren't, aren't, being, uh, aren't coming up, aren't showing in. Well, that's when I mean once it goes onto the market, that's when you you see huge numbers of people taking the drug. So when it's when when the drug is being submitted for approval, they may have clinical trials involving you know um, hundreds of people. But then once it's approved, you're talking about hundreds of thousands or millions of people. And then with that many people taking a drug, rare side effects are going to turn up much more commonly. So in a population of 1,000, you might not see it, or you might see it very rarely, but if it's several hundred thousand, it'll turn up. Okay. I'm talking to Dr. Carl Elliott. He's author of White Coat, Black Hat, Adventures on the Dark Side of Medicine. We're going to take a quick break and talk some more about this, including uh, people who almost, as a profession, throw themselves I into medical studies as guinea pigs for money. Stick around. This is News Radio 830 WCCO. This is the Night Show. Mishki here with you until midnight. My guest this hour, Dr. Carl Elliott, author of the book White Coat, Black Hat Adventures on the Dark Side of Medicine. Uh, I read your book and I come across stuff like fraud kickbacks, lavish gifts given by pharmaceutical reps to doctors. Um, how, can, how can you trust uh, that a doctor is, is working for you more than he is for a pharmaceutical company? Well, that's a problem. I think that's the problem with the gifts is that you don't know if you can trust them. And I think part of the really insidious problem is that the effect of the gifts is not even always that apparent to the doctors who are taking them, the gifts and the money, um, so that any kind of bias or effect on their clinical decision-making isn't really all that apparent even to them. A lot of people listening probably it would be surprised to even to learn that there even is a scenario where drug companies pay off doctors. They, they, would, they would find that shocking and perhaps criminal. That's the norm. Uh, well, you don't really call it payoff in medicine. You call it uh, a consulting fee or a uh, speaking fee, usually. Um, I call it payoff. But Does a doctor... Uh, is, is it in a doctor's best interest financially to push a certain drug at a patient? No. I mean, that, that is uh, illegal. I mean, to, to actually pay a doctor to prescribe That's a not drug what I asked. Direct, directly. But is it, is it in a doctor's financial interest to push a certain drug at a patient? Well, it, it can be indirectly. 
I mean, if, for example, you are getting, you know, half a million dollars a year in consulting fees from a particular company um, and you're not writing their drugs, then that's, you know, that fee is probably not going to continue. Right. A half a million dollars in consulting fees, what, what, what are you doing for that money? Well, a um, number of things. Um, one, uh, you can be giving uh, marketing talks for the company. So they will uh, set up lectures, conference presentations, uh, dinner, uh, dinner talks. Um, but I don't want a drug from a doctor after learning that that doctor gives marketing talks for that pharmaceutical company. I don't trust him anymore. Well, uh, you know, a lot of people, I, I, had, I feel the same way, but a lot of um, patients actually don't seem to mind as much as you would think. And the rationale that they give and that doctors give is that, um, you know, these kinds of arrangements are a mark of how important they are. So, you know, only the best doctors can be hired by drug and device companies, and if a drug or device company is paying me uh, all that much money, it must show that I'm really good at what I do. When, when I first encountered uh, your work, it was in this latest uh, Mother Jones publication. Uh, there's a piece by Carl Elliott in there about uh, research done at the University of Minnesota. Um, Help me remember some of this. The The head of the psychiatric department is a well-paid consultant for a pharmaceutical company. Is that right? Right, for a number of pharmaceutical companies. For a company. number of companies. Right. Okay. And that gentleman also oversees studies. Right. Done by that by those pharmaceutical companies. It's Is it not in his best interest to see that those studies work out favorably? for the pharmaceutical companies? Well, it's certainly... If he's working that, for them. That, that is certainly an inference that, uh, you know, that I, I think one could justifiably make. The pharmaceutical companies pay the school quite a bit of money to conduct these studies. There, well, if you are, if you are um, working in a medical school as an academic physician, you're often expected to generate part of your own salary, either by getting grants, doing these kinds of uh, clinical trials, or by seeing patients. Um, so there's a the constant uh, pressure on that end to, to generate uh, income for yourself and also for the staff whose salaries you're paying. Um, there's also the, the side deals of working as a consultant or a speaker for the same companies that are sponsoring the trials. And there's the money generated usually on a you know, per-subject basis for the university by recruiting patients into the trials. So the more patients you recruit into the trials, the more money uh, the institution gets. The... Powers that be at the University of Minnesota do not have an ethical concern with the extraordinarily cozy relationship between that school and pharmaceutical companies? N not as much of a concern as I do and as a lot of people do. do. Would they find it odd that you or I or others have a concern? They disagree. I'm not sure they would find it odd um, because there are some fairly... Uh, you know, vocal, strong-minded uh, critics out there. Might, if they were honest, might they say, yes, in a perfect world we wouldn't have this arrangement, but unfortunately the way things are set up in a capitalistic society, we have to have this kind of cozy relationship or we won't have the drugs to help people. Right, and we, not only will we not have the drugs to help people, I think they would say um, we would run into, run into a sh funding shortfall for the institution. I mean, w what's happened is that, you know, over the past 20 years, there has evolved a, a, an extremely large and profitable private drug testing system, 
which uh, you know runs generally runs clinical trials um, quicker and more efficiently and is better at recruiting patients and shepherding the drug through the regulatory process than universities used to be. Can they be trusted any more or less because they're private than a place like the U of M? Well, I, I used to think that they that they couldn't uh, be trusted as much because of that financial mm-hmm. uh, self interest. But I think that you know the problem is that if universities want to compete with them, they have to play the same game. So universities are competing in the marketplace against the contract research organizations. Everybody's sort of playing by the same uh, market rules. 